Um, I've had the privilege of filling in for him on occasion, um, as we, we both uh, attended Hasbro Bible Church for many years, and, and I had the opportunity to fill in for him as he went on uh, missions trips and whenever he wasn't there. But that was actually very rare because um, Dr. Frankel is probably the most consistent teacher, layperson that I have ever met in my life. Um, <laughs> he rarely, rarely ever goes on any vacations. And um, he's also very rarely ever sick. I think the only time I ever saw him sick was uh, one time he had a cold, but he still taught. And so he's, <laughs> he's usually here. And uh, so this is a, a kind of a rare occurrence where I can fill in and I'm happy to do so. And uh, before we get started um, in our uh, next chapter of the book of Acts, um, I wanted to ask Dwayne if he could just come up for a minute. Dwayne is going to be going on a missions trip with his healing hands, um, and I'd like him to just uh, tell us a little bit about where he's going, what he'll be doing, and most importantly, how we can pray for him. And, um, and that's, that's really the most important thing. So, Dwayne. So, uh, Friday we have a, a His Healing Hands team. We're going to uh, Peru and um, going to a new city in Peru. And it's on the east side of the Andes Mountains in the Amazon jungle of part of Peru. And um, you can hear me. Okay. So, first time there. We're working with uh, people from the city we've uh, gone to before, Terrapoto. And uh, half the team will be from there. They'll be our translators. And um, ask who can go. Anybody can go. Uh, and uh, we, medical people or just lay people, people just do whatever we're asked to do. Um, how you can pray for us. Uh, we know that there are dark forces, evil forces in the world that want to thwart the gospel. And we've run across that times on some of our trips. And so we always ask for your prayers to uh, help us with that so that things go smoothly. So we, we do appreciate your prayers as we go on these trips for uh, protection and that um, everything works for us. So thank you for your prayers. Uh, Friday. And we've gone for eight or nine days, something like that. It's about a week, a little over a week. So you'll be... Uh, flying out of LAX on... Flying out of LAX, 9 o'clock at night, 8-hour flight to Peru. Okay. Well, let's, let's take just a moment and pray for Dwayne. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this man who has um, stepped up to go on the team to a place that's quite far away, to a place that, um, Lord, that is um, difficult, and yet... Lord, um, I just thank you that he has a desire to see the gospel spread and to see um, the lives of people changed. And so, Lord, we, we pray now that your hand would be upon him, upon every member of the team, upon all those that they come in contact with and that they work with, Lord, that you'd protect him from the enemy. Lord, that you would, would oversee every single aspect of their travel. I pray, Lord, for their safety. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you now would be opening up opportunities for them and people's hearts, most importantly, that you would open their hearts, that they might know the Lord and Savior. And Lord, um, I ask that you would put a hedge of protection about them, and that you would preserve them and keep them and use them for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Dwayne. Keep praying this week um, and next week for the whole team. And, um, you know, if, if I were in his shoes, I would really want you to be praying for me. And I know that he wants you to be praying for him. It, it is, it's... There's nothing like being in that set of shoes and, and actually being the one going. And so I just want you to think about that. You, you would certainly want others praying for you.
Well, let's, uh, let's open um, to the book of Acts, and we're going to continue on in chapter 18. Uh, last week, uh, we saw in uh, Acts 17 how the church at Thessalonica was founded. Um, that, was, that was quite an interesting chapter that we studied. Uh, Paul, he, he preached, um, and he had a mixed uh, result. Some believed, some didn't. Some mocked him, uh, and others willingly and readily received the word of God. And I was referring to the Bereans. Um, love the Bereans because it says they received it readily and eagerly. And it says that uh, the Bible says in chapter 17 of Acts that they were more noble um, than the others that were in the city of Thessalonica because not only did they receive the word of God, but they, they went back to the scriptures. They had the Old Testament to see if those things were true that Paul was teaching on. And I'm sure Paul probably quoted out of Isaiah. That's the messianic uh, book, specifically chapter 53, speaking of the Messiah. And, and they went back and they looked. Is this really true, what, what Paul was saying? And uh, um, it says they were more noble because they did that. And unfortunately, there were a large number of individuals um, that were stirred up by jealousy. And I'm sure that, um, that Satan stirred up their hearts, the hearts of the unbelieving Jews. And there's always some in the crowd. It says some wicked men, uh, lewd, lewd fellows of a baser sort. They set the city in an uproar. That's in chapter 17, verse 5. But fortunately... The, the brethren, they got Paul and Silas out of the city under the cover of night um, before they were seized and murdered by the mob. They were, they were um, looking for blood, and this wasn't the first time that Paul's life had been threatened. Uh, you remember back in Philippi um, where he was, um, he was um, taken and, uh, and beaten um, there, were, there were many accounts where his life was in peril. And in some instances, God allowed him to be whipped and to be beaten with rods and, in fact, to be stoned and left for dead. And yet, Paul, it wasn't his time. It wasn't his time. And he once was stoned, left for dead. They thought they had killed him. And... It says that he got up. He probably was knocked unconscious. He got up and he walked back into the city. And that takes a lot, a lot of guts to do that. Yeah. And, um, and Paul, um, he is fulfilling the prophecy that the Lord himself declared to Ananias way back, I believe it's in chapter... Um, Six, where he tells Ananias that there's a man named Saul of Tarsus and he's waiting for you. He's, he's blind and he is my chosen vessel unto the Gentiles and I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And, and from that point forward, Saul of Tarsus, whom we know as Paul the Apostle, did suffer greatly. And um, it's interesting that the Lord chose him. He says, he's my chosen vessel. Here he was on his way to murder Christians on the road to Damascus, and God intercepts him. And his life was never the same. It was never... Um, how maybe he envisioned it. It uh, was turned 180 degrees on itself. And here we find the Apostle Paul um, compelled to take the word to the Gentiles. Have you ever wondered what the Bible would be like if we didn't have the book of Acts? Think about it for a minute. We go from the Gospels to the letter to the Romans. If we didn't have Acts, we wouldn't even know who Paul was. 
Who's this guy writing letters to the churches named Paul? If we didn't have the book of Acts to understand how God intercepted him and, and saved this man and set him uh, uh, aside to, to be his apostle to the Gentiles, all of the epistles wouldn't really make any sense to us. In fact, we wouldn't even know if we should trust them or believe them. But the book of Acts was written, and Dr. Luke did travel with Paul and with Silas and with Barnabas and with Timothy and many others, and he wrote these things down. And what's so amazing is it's been preserved for the last 2,000 years accurately and completely for us to study. So here we are now at First Baptist Church studying the things that, that happened 2,000 years ago. And we have, the, we have the privilege of being able to do that without fear of someone coming in that door and arresting us. We have the Word of God, not only you know, in written form, we have it on our phones. We have uh, so many avenues of study. We, we can look up things uh, on the internet. We have the ability to, um, to uh, consult commentaries and be able to study the Word of God in a way that most of the world doesn't. We are very privileged. And, and so I just remind you of that as we gather here this morning that we are so blessed not just that we have the book of acts not just that it was preserved for us not just that we can study it in safety and and in the the comfort of this hall but that you have the holy spirit to give you understanding and you have um you have the word of god in front of you and it's, it, it's quite, quite a privilege. When Paul um, preached uh, in Athens back in chapter 17, uh, he preached about the unknown God. And he gave a, a magnificent, brilliant sermon because he had noticed that there was a God that they called the unknown God and they wanted to make sure that they didn't offend that unknown God. They had many gods that they worshiped. And um, it's just like the Lord to bring that to Paul's attention. I'm sure he's probably just walking by looking at, at all of these edifices that they worship, and he comes across one called the unknown God. And he goes, huh, I can use that. And he did, and he preached. And it says that some believed and Others were doubtful. Some mocked him. Um, and then others said, we'll hear you another time, another day. In other words, come back again. But they never would because Paul went out of their midst. In chapter 17, verse 33, he was led to go uh, to Corinth. And those that said, we'll hear you another day. They never got that opportunity. This is why Paul writes um, in 2 Corinthians, now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. There may not be another chance because for each hearer of the gospel, there is a time to respond in repentance and faith. There's no guarantee of another day. Whenever you have the privilege to tell someone about Christ, whether it it might be a neighbor, it might be a coworker, it might be a relative, it might be someone you meet at the park when you're walking your dogs. That may be the time when God has ordained that they should hear the gospel. There may not be another day. And so, whatever, wherever God has placed you, you have a sphere of influence whether it be in your neighborhood, whether it be with those that are family, or as I mentioned earlier, where you walk your dog, that's your sphere of influence. Those are the individuals that you have opportunity to share Christ with. Remember this. 
the ones that said, we'll hear you another day, they never did. Athens was, was renowned by the world for its wisdom, but the wisdom of a man can never discern the things of God. Their faith was hindered by human wisdom, which cannot lead to salvation. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In 1 Corinthians 3.19, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. And that's what Athens was all about. They thought they were wise. Man's greatest, highest, and wisest thoughts are useless in knowing God. Well, now I'd like you to turn to Acts chapter 18. We're going to pick up the story of Acts where Paul arrives at Corinth. Uh, the city of Corinth was located in southern Greece, and uh, it's in what uh, the, was the Roman province of Achaia. It was about 45, 45 miles uh, west of Athens. And uh, it's interesting because the Olympian Games were actually played there. They were hosted by Corinth. So this brought a lot of people to the town. It was, it was a very a highly populated place. Um, but there was a real problem there. Even by pagan standards, even by their own standards, uh, the standards of their own culture, it became so morally corrupt that its very name, Corinth, became synonymous with debauchery and, and, and moral depravity. To Corinthianize came to represent gross immorality and drunken debauchery. And in fact, Paul lists some of the specific sins for which the city was noted and which formerly had characterized many of the believers uh, that were in the church there. They had come out of this. Paul wrote uh, in his letter to, um, to the church of Corinth, he said, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified. Ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. That's what they were walking into. And um, as we look and read the text this morning, we're going to see um, that these ones that, that came out of this um, were ones whom God set his heart upon, set his eyes upon to save. Follow with me in Acts chapter 18, starting in verse 1. And I'd like to, uh, to just read uh, here the first 11 verses. After these things... Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, Italy, come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because that Claudius, Claudius was the, um, the Roman emperor, he had commanded that all Jews depart from Rome and, they came and, and he came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, Paul was a tent maker and so was Aquila and Priscilla, because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and, and worked, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. When they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth, I go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid. But speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. 
I'll stop there for a moment. Like, uh, like most Greek cities, Corinth had an acropolis. That was, um, it was 200, two, excuse me, almost 2,000 feet. It was about 1,850 feet above sea level. And it was uh, used for both defense and for worship. Um, the most prominent edifice on the Acropolis was the temple to Aphrodite. That was the Greek goddess of love. And uh, there were over a thousand priestesses who were essentially religious prostitutes that lived and worked there. That was why Corinth uh, was known for being so mor morally corrupt. One of the reasons. The, um, the church in Corinth was founded by Paul and, as it mentions in the text, Silas and Timothy. Um, on the second, this was Paul's second missionary journey where he was assisted by two Jewish believers. And they're mentioned here, this is the first time we hear of them, Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife. And it says that Paul lived with them for a while because they were fellow tent makers, and, and they, they worked together. You know, they probably uh, occasionally had to ask, do you, you, have, you got a grommet? Do you have, a, do you have a, <laughs> some extra stitching? Uh, you know, they probably worked together and, and building tents, and um, they, got, they got to know each other. And soon after, um, Silas and Timothy joins them. And Paul began preaching even more intensely in the synagogue. When most of the Jews resisted the gospel, he left the synagogue, but not before Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and his whole family, and many other Corinthians, were converted. Um, and this is, uh, um, this is where Paul... gets himself into trouble oftentimes, is when people start getting saved, and especially the leader, the chief ruler of the synagogue, ooh, that, that's gonna cause some trouble. Um, Corinth is where the Holy Spirit has led Paul to preach the gospel. It's certainly not a godly place. You know, oftentimes we might ask ourselves, Lord, why me, or why here, or why this situation? And um, I heard this response from an older man who had walked with God for a long time. And his response was, Lord, why not me? And it always struck me, Lord, why not me? Um, he could say that because he knew and he trusted in the one whom he had served all his life. How could the one whom he has loved and served all his life ever do him wrong? So he could say, Lord, why not me? Look at verse 2. Um, Paul found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Um, Emperor Claudius had expelled the Jews in, um, in about AD 49, and this is where they wind up. Is that coincidence? Is it coincidence that they're tent makers and that's what Paul is? I don't think so. The Lord brought these, this couple, this husband and wife, right to Paul. And it's likely that Aquila and Priscilla were already converted to Christianity before they ever met Paul. We don't know that for certain, but the text doesn't tell us that Paul witnessed to them. It says that he was joined, he worked with them. And um, I'm sure that if they weren't saved, he would have witnessed to them. But the fact is, is that the text doesn't tell us. Um, now, we, we, there was already a church in Rome where they had been expelled from. You might recall back in Acts 8, chapter 4, when Saul of Tarsus was hunting down Christians, it caused a scattering effect. The Christians scattered throughout all the land. Uh, they scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the word. It's not unlikely that many fled to Rome to escape persecution. Years later, Paul writes in his letter to the Church of Rome, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Also greet the church that is in their house. So 
Aquila and Priscilla had a church in their house. By the time Paul wrote his epistle to the Romans, Aquila and Priscilla had evidently returned back to Rome, and they were not only co-laborers for the gospel alongside Paul, but also risked their own lives to save his. Aquila and Priscilla had been forced to move their business out of Rome because of the decree of, of uh, Claudius, but they landed in Corinth, and Paul likely encountered them as he was looking for work to support himself. And Paul and Silas and Timothy, with the help of this Christian couple, will now plant a church in Corinth, and many will get saved. In verse 4, it says that Paul was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. That's what evangelism is. It's persuading unbelievers of the truth of Scripture concerning God. But don't get me wrong. It's not your eloquence of speech or your ability to, to um, somehow convince someone against their will. Persuading is, 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 is merely sharing with them the gospel and answering their questions. And how will you be able to answer their questions unless you know the word of God? And so I commend you for being here this morning to study the word of God and to see how these men and women shared, evangelized, persuaded others, preaching the gospel of God to the Jews, first in the synagogue. That's what Paul did. And Paul was no slouch, by the way. He worked hard all week making tents and then spent his only day off in the synagogue persuading these unbelieving Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. He, he was a hard worker. And, and, and he only had that one opportunity during the week to, to go to the synagogue and preach. And that'd be a hard thing. You know, if, if here he is. He's, he goes as a, as a missionary, but he doesn't have any support, at least not yet. God's going to take care of that. And um, in verse 5, when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, it says that Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Now, Acts does not record this, but while in Athens, in the previous chapter, Paul had sent Timothy and Silas back to Macedonia. Timothy went to uh, Thessalonica. Silas likely went to Philippi. But now they're back with him at Corinth. And if we're not careful, we could miss God's graciousness in his providence towards Paul. The Lord provided Paul with, first of all, with work to support himself, tent making. <clears throat> he had been working his trade so as not to be a burden upon the people. And this took time away from his preaching of the gospel, but the Lord is about to change that. When Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, it says Paul began devoting himself completely to the word. Well, what changed? How was Paul able to devote himself completely to the word without working? Well, Paul was greatly encouraged by the return of Silas and Timothy and the gift that they brought with them from Philippi. Paul later writes to the church at Philippi, you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my needs. That's Philippians 4, 15. And so by examining some of the epistles that Paul wrote later, we see that um, it was the church of Philippi that sent a gift. Uh, they gave it to Silas and Timothy. and said, take this to Paul. And so Paul was able to, to preach full time now. God gave him what he needed. In verse 6, it says the Jews resisted his message. Now, <clears throat> a lot of times our English language doesn't really do justice to uh, what, was, what was happening here. Uh, this word resist, uh, the Greek word for resisted is uh, antitasso, and it literally means to arrange in battle array. Uh, these Jews were angry. And so when it says they resisted, it wasn't just talk and, and you know, arguing. It, it says that, I mean, they were very upset. 
and, and, and to the point where it says to arrange in battle array. This wasn't a casual disagreement. It says they even blasphemed the name of Christ Jesus. And when they did that, Paul, it says he shook his garments out. That's a, a tradition. Uh, it's a traditional Jewish gesture of rejecting something, a cleansing of one's filth. A Jew might do this when leaving unbelievers, uh, like uh, if they were in the presence of Gentiles or Samaritans, they would shake out their garments. Now, there might not have been any dust or anything that came out of their garments, but it was a symbolic gesture saying, I'm, I'm shaking out the filth that I acquired by being in your presence. And that's what Paul does. Paul is saying that those who have rejected Christ are responsible for the consequences of their belief. And he made the statement, he said to them, your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. When we faithfully and lovingly preach the whole counsel of God, we do well and, and we are blameless. Be faithful to speaking the truth of the gospel and let the word of God have its effect upon those that you've had the privilege to proclaim it to. And then pray for them, but let God do the rest. You might be, they might reject what you have to say. And, um, and that's hard. But I believe that the very fact that God gave you the privilege to talk to them, what comes with that privilege is the responsibility to pray for them and to keep praying for them. Who knows what God will do? Paul left there, and he went to the house of a man named Justice. He, he left um, the synagogue when they blasphemed the name of Christ Jesus, and he goes to a man named Justice, a worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue. Now, as Paul left the synagogue, he didn't go very far. He just went to the house next door. In fact, they shared a common wall. Uh, the house of Justice and the synagogue shared a common wall. And he went into this man's house. His full name is uh, Titus Justice. And his name indicates that he is a Roman. Regardless of this, who this man was, Paul was staying in his house right next to the synagogue, and he was preaching the name of Jesus, which would have greatly angered the Jews. So they hadn't gotten rid of him. He just moved next door. And what happened? Verse 8, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. His whole household got saved. And he was the chief ruler. Now, you can see why Paul uh, was hated by the unbelieving Jews. They would have really been infuriated when the chief ruler, their chief ruler, converts to the other side. Now trouble's begun. Verses 9 through 11, as more Jews and Gentiles converted to Christianity, we know that what Paul was expecting, the Jewish leaders had always become jealous, stirring up the people to violent revolt. But the Lord said to Paul, in the night by a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. Now, I, I remember years ago just reading right past that verse and not thinking too much of it, but how can God say to Paul, I have much people in this city? It's just Paul and his team, and then Crispus, and a few others, that's not a lot. But God says, I have much people in this city. Some had believed, most had not. When God says, I have much people, could God be referring to those who had not yet come to him? Those whom he elected before the foundation of the world that belonged to him? Found in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Jesus said, Jesus said this, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Think about it. What was God saying to Paul? I have much people in this city. I think he was reminding Paul that they, those individuals were his. And it was Paul that was going to be the instrument to proclaim the gospel. And it would be the Holy Spirit that would bring conviction upon their hearts and give them faith and repentance and come to the Lord. And so I, when I read that verse now um, where 
Jesus says in verse 9, the Lord spoke to Paul, and he tells him not to be afraid, for I have much people in this city. What about in your sphere of influence? Where you live, your neighbors, where you walk your dog, if you have a dog, if you go to the grocery store, um, people that you run into, individuals that are in your sphere of influence, um, perhaps there are many that are God's, and they are his, and he will bring them to himself. And you have that privilege of being able to be the one to be used of God. Um, that's what this passage reminds me of. Every one of us has some sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. it, it may not be big, but the Lord has placed you wherever you are. Yeah. And you have that privilege. You know the truth. Let others in on it. Let them know. If, if they reject you, uh, pray for them. But know that, that it's not coincidence that they also are within your sphere of influence. God has placed them there. Now, I want to look at verses 12 through 17 in Acts chapter 18. And this, uh, this event occurred. God was, I think, watching over Paul. It says, when Gallio was deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul. They were riled up. They were mad that their leader, the chief ruler, Crispus, had gotten saved, and that he was now on Paul's side. That's how they viewed it. And um, the fact is, is um, there's no sides. When, do you recall when, um, in the book of Joshua, when Joshua was about to um, go up against Jericho. And he was by himself, and he, he glanced up, and he saw a man standing with a sword. And he said to him, whose side are you on? Do you remember the man's response? Well, that man who was standing before Joshua was the pre-incarnate Christ. And his response was, neither. But I have come as captain of the hosts of the Lord. He is not on our side. We are on his side. And, and I've always, always been impressed by that verse. When Josh, Joshua asks him, whose side are you on? He says, neither. For I've come as captain of the host of the Lord. We are on his side. And so these, these unbelievers, they think that their leader has gone to the other side and they... Um, they they cause a, an insurrection. Um, and in verse 12, uh, they, in one accord, they, they brought Paul before the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth to speak, Gallio said unto the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, or ye Jews reason, um, O ye Jews reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names of your law, look to it yourselves, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sophanes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. A couple little comments there. Uh, after... Um, Paul is, is able to lead the, the chief ruler of the synagogue to Christ. I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back and that caused this insurrection. But Paul had broken no Roman laws. He had not committed any vicious crime. So uh, Gallio, he was the proconsul of Rome, uh, he drove them away from the judgment seat. Um, he said, there, this isn't a matter of, our, uh, of Roman law. And this was also by God's grace, is it could have gone the other way for Paul. Um, it, it's interesting, Paul didn't even have to speak for himself. Gallio just said, dismissed. And, um, and so what did they do? They, they took hold of some poor guy named Sothenes, uh, 
it says that he was the new leader of the synagogue, and they beat him in front of the judgment seat, um, but Gallio was not concerned about it. The text does not explain why Sothenes was beaten, but most likely because he also believed Paul's message. Now verses 18 to 23. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence to Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn or shaved his head and centura, for he had made a vow. In verse 19, and he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer, a longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God wills. And he sailed from Ephesus, and when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phyregia in order, strengthening all the disciples. So after ministering in Corinth uh, for a year and a half, Paul took Priscilla and Aquila and with him to Ephesus, and from there he returned to Israel. And it says in verse 18 that um, uh, in, in the city of Centra, Paul had shaved his head for he was keeping a vow. Now, you might just pass right over that and think nothing to that, um, but there is quite a bit to that little tidbit of information. Though Paul had renounced the need for keeping the ceremonial law to obtain eternal salvation, he was still a Jew, and he observed Jewish heritage. And wanting to honor God, he takes a Nazarite vow. Uh, what is a Nazarite vow? This is a special Jewish sacrificial vow of separation and devotion to God. Found, it's found in Numbers chapter 6, the Nazarite vow. And the vow could be taken, excuse me, the vow could be taken for a lifetime or, or for a few days, weeks, or months. There wasn't a time period uh, associated with it. And the, the way you took the vow was it began with the shaving of your head. And then however long that vow went, whether it be weeks or months or years, the vow ended with, again, the shaving of your head. So it started with the shaving of your head, and it ended with the shaving of your head. If you go back and read it, um, it says um, that there were things that one must abstain from when you take the Nazarite vow. One of the things that you abstain from is cutting your hair or your beard or drinking wine or any strong drink. You could not eat or drink anything from the grapevine, nor do anything that would make you unclean, like touching a dead body or, or, or things that were in the, in the Jewish ceremonial law that would make you unclean, uh, touching a leper, a lot of things could make you unclean. But after having completed the vow, the Nazarite shall then shave his head at the doorway of the tent of meeting. This was when they had the tabernacle. Now they have the temple, so they would go to the temple and they would shave their head there, and they would take the dedicated hair of their head and put it on the fire, which is under the sacrifice of peace offerings, and that would complete the vow. Now the vow is completed. Have you ever wondered about Samson? He had taken that vow. And when you go back and you read numbers of how the vow ends, it ends with the shaving of your head. Now Samson, it says he was asleep when Delilah shaved his head. But um, that ended the vow. And I've always wondered it, that, that his... His strength was not in his hair. It was the Holy Spirit. But he had, he had taken the vow, um, I believe, from his youth. And, and when that occurred, the vow ended. And um, it, it's, it's, it is a, uh, another aspect of Samson's life. Um, he didn't end the vow, but he did allow his vow to be ended by keeping company with Delilah. And, um, and that was a, a, um, a, a tragic end of his vow. God wasn't finished with him yet. 
I've always often wondered about the whole aspect of his uh, strength leaving him when his head was shaved. And, and I, I see that it's, it was the end of his vow. It says, Then they came to Ephesus, and Paul leaves Aquila and Priscilla there to minister to the people. So Paul and the mission team arrive in Ephesus together, where he left Aquila and Priscilla. These two would stay there for several years, having a church in their home. And Paul references them later in his letter to the Corinthians. The, he says in 1 Corinthians 16, 19, The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So Aquila and Priscilla, they, they had a church in their house. Husband and wife team. That's interesting. You know, sometimes this verse is taken out of context and used by certain churches to defend having a woman pastor. They will quote this verse in 1 Corinthians 16, 19, where it says, the churches of Asa salute you, Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. And they say, see, they're husband and wife, they're pastors. And that's the verse they'll use. <clears throat> the verse, um, nowhere in the text does it say that Priscilla held an elder or a pastoral position in the church that they led out of their home. Now, I'm confident that she ministered to the women and the children, but nowhere does the text indicate that she functioned as a pastor in their home church. But oftentimes, this, this verse is used to defend having um, women as, as the pastor. And I just bring it up because I want to, you know, as you study through the Word of God, you come across verses that are often used by specific churches for one of their major doctrines. And you find out, as you study it, that that's not what it's saying at all. That's not what it's teaching at all. And it's important for us, as we go through the book of Acts, to address those things. Um, next week, we're, we're going to look at baptism. And we're going to see how um, um, oftentimes baptism is completely uh, misunderstood where some churches declare, as part of their doctrine, that you're not saved unless you're baptized. And they quote these verses in Acts. And if you just take that one verse, and that's all you look at, you might be able to see their point of view. But we're going to look at it in the context of the entire Word of God. And we're going to see that um, baptism does not save you. Um, baptism is a result. It is the result of obedience for someone that has been saved. Come for that next week. So, um, Paul says he did not consent to stay because he had an obligation or a vow to God that needed to be fulfilled. This is likely why Paul left Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus, and those new converts needed to be taught. And we know that God did will his return because Paul returns to Ephesus on his third missionary journey, which we're going to look at next week. God did will his return. Um, and then we'll finish, let's, let's look at the last few verses. In a certain, this is verse 24, chapter 18, 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, a mighty in the scriptures, comes to Ephesus this man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And when he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was dis uh, disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, he helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So when Paul departs from Ephesus for Jerusalem, he leaves behind Aquila and Priscilla to carry on the witness. And imagine their surprise on one, one Sabbath day, this guy named Apollos shows up, and he starts preaching in the synagogue. And everything he's preaching is correct. 
Everything he's saying is, is, is true. Um, he knew the Old Testament scriptures well, and he was able to teach them uh, with eloquence and power. He was fervent in spirit and diligent in the presentation of the message. Um, the only problem was that as this enthusiastic man was declaring an incomplete gospel, his message got as far as John the Baptist, and then it stopped. He knew nothing about Calvary or the resurrection of Christ or the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. He had zeal, but he lacked spiritual knowledge. And, and so uh, the ministry of, of um, John the Baptist was as far as he knew, and that's as far as he, he, he got. Apollos knew about the promises, but he did not know about the fulfillment. Where did Apollos get his message to begin with? Well, probably from some of John, John the Baptist's disciples. Um, we don't know how he, he, he obviously studied the scripture. And so Aquila and Priscilla, having been trained by Paul, were able to take Apollos aside and told him about Jesus Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. They led him into a deeper knowledge of Christ, expounding unto him the way of God more perfectly. And the next Sabbath, Apollos returned to the synagogue and he gave the Jews the rest of the story. Here, Apollos not only strengthened the saints, but he also debated with the unbelieving Jews. It says he convinced many of them that Jesus is the Messiah. And he later had a ministry in Corinth and he was one of Paul's trusted helpers. God is not just using Paul to accomplish his purpose. He's using Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos to lead many to Christ. And I'll close with this. The, the Acts of the Apostles, it, it ends in chapter 28. We're not there yet. But the Acts of the Saints of First Baptist Church of Paso Robles continues on to this day. We continue the story. Started in Acts and we'll finish it one day in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But you are part of this story, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. Next week, come. Paul's going to return to Ephesus on his third missionary journey, and um, he, this is where he spends the most time in one city that he's ever spent. He spends three years there. And we're going to, it's an exciting chapter, chapter 18. So come next week. Let's close in prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for preserving the book of Acts for our benefit that we might understand how you worked in the early church and how you work in our lives today. Lord, no matter where our sphere of influence is in our world, in our lives, when we get up in the morning, I pray, Lord, that you would use it for your glory. May the words that come out of our mouth be that which edifies and builds up and glorifies your name. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.